Hello, 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 my friends. It is Sunday, June 14th. It is time for an IC support group meeting. And would you believe I'm just a wee bit early? <laughs> How often does that happen? Not very often. So uh, my purpose in doing these meetings is to make you so knowledgeable, so incredibly informed that no one can ever mess with you again, that no one can tell you that IC is all in your head, that no one can tell you that, that there is no treatment, that no one can tell you that there is no hope because there is hope, my friends. There is tremendous hope. Hello, Julianne. Hi, Shannon. Hi, Barbara. Hello, Nancy. Nice to see you, you guys. I was just... Uh, I was just getting my uh, my groove on listening to Lady Gaga and our Ariana Grande's new song. It's just like, yeah, come on, we gotta we gotta relax, my friends. Hello, Donna, how are you today? Now let's just do a sound check here. How is the sound? Everybody feel, hearing the sound okay? Testing one two three. Testing one two three. How is that sound? Oh my goodness gracious. Yeah, testing. Hmm. Facebook. All right, my friends on Facebook, how is the sound? Could you give me a feedback and let me know how it is? Hello, Jennifer. Oh, Jennifer is in bed with a heating pad. Girl, we got to fix that. Hello, Krishendra. Hello, Don. <laughs> Don says, dang, your hair grew back quickly. Welcome to my life. Look at this. Can you believe how long this hair is? If you look at if you look at the videos a year ago, my hair was here. My hair literally goes and in, grows an inch a month. It's ridiculous. Good. Shannon says the sound is great on Facebook. All right, my friends on YouTube, how is the sound here? Hi, Karen. Thank you. I'm so so glad. So I was on um, oh, this weekend um, working on. Oh, Karen says she's on the couch with a heating pad too. Well, darn it. Darn it, darn it, darn it. Um, uh, I have been a little bit remiss in sending out our IC networking newsletters. Normally they go out once every month or once every two months. I realized I hadn't sent one out in three months. Not surprising given the chaos of COVID, right? Guess the chaos of us just dealing with our lives and trying to get through the stress of what's been happening in the last month. But um, I was able to finally send out two, two uh, newsletters over the weekend. I sent one to our members and then uh, I sent one to our just normal, regular uh, public newsletter that goes to um, about 40,000 people. And so hopefully we'll have some more people join us, especially for our Zoom meeting. We'll see. I don't know. Um, I did decide that every Sunday I'm going to start on YouTube and Facebook. We're going to do 90 minutes on YouTube and Facebook. And then we're going to move on over to Zoom and do a more personal Zoom meeting. The Zoom room is not open yet. I'm not going to turn it on for an hour because I don't want a lot of people coming in there. Um, oh, Linda says, just got over a huge flare, ble bleeding, burning, nausea, shaking, pain was so bad, got antibiotics, been, in, been a week in bed, I need a cure so bad. All right, so Linda, where were you bleeding from, hon? Where were you bleeding? Bleeding, I'm telling you guys, listen, bleeding is really not typical in the IC patient. The only time we see bleeding from the bladder, there's three contexts that we see bleeding from the bladder. Number one, a really, really bad urinary tract infection. So Linda, I'm assuming since you say you got antibiotics that your doctor must have thought you had an anti, you had a uh, bacterial infection, correct? The second time we could see bleeding from the bladder is actually bladder cancer. Um, that's how we often know that there might be cancer growing in the bladder is sometimes those cancer cells bleed. But more than likely also we see bleeding from Hunter's lesions. So if you're somebody who's been diagnosed with Hunter's ulcers, Hunter's lesions, lesions are known for what we call a waterfall effect. They can bleed so profusely that it looks like a blood waterfall in the bladder, especially a hydrodistension and you're peeing blood clots and you're, and you're peeing blood. The odds are that you pro they either overstretch your bladder or you've got Hunter's lesions that they probably needed to cauterize. So, so anytime we see bleed, bleeding, we want to take that really, really seriously. You know, for me, I think for those of you who attended my support group meetings before, um, 
I don't like big facts. And if I were bleeding excessively, like I was bleeding vaginally three years ago, okay, it turned out to be early uterine cancer. Listen, if I'm bleeding, I want somebody to look at it and tell me what's bleeding. And if you continue to have visible blood in your urine where you're passing blood clots, it's probably look in your bladder, at least with a cystoscope to see if they can see what could be bleeding. I mean, for all we know, maybe it's a kidney that's bleeding, right? So bleeding is really, really serious. Julianne says, I haven't been feeling all that great. I just got diagnosed with endo. Girl, I am so, so sorry. Endo is what we call an evil twin to IC. They often coexist. Endometriosis. Endometriosis can migrate throughout the abdomen, but it is often known to attach to the bladder wall on the outside of the bladder. And sometimes the endo can be so aggressive that it can actually breach through the bladder. And so if uh, they find that you're, or suspect that your endometriosis is pretty aggressive, um, it would have a sonogram to take a look at that and maybe even have a laparoscopy to take a look around. I had a laparoscopy in September of 1993 because I thought that my IC was something much more serious than it turned out to be. Maddie says, trying to conceive and coming off a Cymbalta my system has been off whack. Maddie, girl, Cymbalta is hard to get off of. We call it Cymbalta discontinuation syndrome. I wish you well with that. That is hard. Hello, Cynthia. We're going to see what we can do to help you, Cynthia. But let me, before we do that, let me just go ahead and introduce myself for those of you who are new. My guidance network. I'm the longest serving IC support group leader here in the United States. We're talking 20, how on earth did that time pass? I don't know because on the inside, I still feel 25. I do not feel 27 years older. Um, I bring to you a degree in chemistry, a degree in pharmacology, drug development. Uh, I could not stand the research with animals that was being done and went into psychology. I have a master's in psychology. I have a presidential internship slash fellowship from the White House back in 1988. Yes, I am that old. And the IC Network was my doctoral dissertation proposal for my PhD in psychology, which unfortunately I could not get because of years without bawling my eyes out. The thought of driving any more than 15 minutes from my house for five years was very, very challenging. And for those of you who know, IC can be really, really painful when you're able to do that PhD, but I'm very happy that my proposed doctoral dissertation has been rated number one in the world by Harvard Medical School and the University of London. It's all not, it was not for naught. Uh, we are here, we are here to help you and um, understand that when my goal is to make you so knowledgeable, so informed that you will be able to go back in and have really good constructive conversations with your doctor. I do not give medical advice. It is not my place to give you any medical advice. My job is to educate you, explain options to you, discuss subtyping with you, and then kick you in the you know what and get you back so that you can have a really good productive discussion with your doctor about what your treatments are and where you would like to be from here. So um, normally back uh, uh, several months ago, we were only doing these meetings twice a month on the first and third Sunday. I have now switched to doing them almost every Sunday. And now we have also switched to doing them on Zoom. So right now we are simulcasting on Facebook up here, YouTube down here. We're going to be in this forum for about 90 minutes and we're going to head on over to Zoom for anybody who wants to talk because it's not just about me talking, it's about you talking. Now, I don't know how many people will have because I did basically invite 40,000 people and our room only has the capacity for 300. But anyway, today is going to be an adventure, my friends. Today is going to be an adventure. Now, for those of you on Facebook, please understand that Facebook does not often let me scroll back and look at your questions. So if I have missed your question, please do not take this personally. Ask it again, ask it again. On YouTube, I have a much easier chance on YouTube of being able to see questions. Now, normally when I do these meetings, I do a, a 20 minutes or so of some sort of educational lecture, educational content, and then we dive into your questions. 
Um, we've got some newbies here on, and uh, hopefully we will be able to come back and go over subtyping and stuff like that. But I want to talk about one thing. So before I get to your questions, okay, our members, y'all should have gotten your spring magazine. This is our spring magazine. Um, and um, we review in depth uh, the first four lawsuits filed on Elmeron and eye disease, okay? And so we continue to have many, many reports of patients now contacting, contacting us and sharing that they indeed have uh, some sort of eye retinal disease, usually pigmentary maculopathy, uh, as a result possibly of using Elmeron. So we now have four cases that have been filed, federal cases, uh, and the attorney of record, Stacy, has uh, completed an extensive Q&A for us. Another thing I have in here that I think is really important, now remember, I always say that you are an anatomical we don't think about IC as an, here, hold on. My, okay, my desk is being weird. Here, hold on. I got to be able to move my chair around. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Okay. <laughs> I got to be comfortable too. So, so you are an anatomical mystery to be solved. We do not think of IC as an incurable bladder disease anymore. We don't. Why? Because for many people, there are structures outside of the bladder that are often involved, like earlier endometriosis or pelvic floor injury. And so if you are in the process of being diagnosed, it is important that you understand that there are quite a few things that we want to rule out first, because it would be really sad for you to think, hey, I've had a bladder infection for the last 20 years when in fact you had a fibroid tumor pushing on your bladder. And once the tumor was fixed, your bladder symptoms went away. Or if you were on antibiotics for a decade, only to discover after the fact that you actually had a muscle injury, right? And that it all goes back to the fact that when you were a kid, you fell, you broke your tailbone, your tailbone hooked, healed crooked, it's messed up your pelvic floor, your pelvic floor muscles are messed up, which is now messing up your bladder. So for those of you who are in the process of being diagnosed, over on our website, icnetwork.org, icnetwork.org, we have a list of confusable conditions. And it's really, really important that you try to work through these, this ex kind of exhaustive list, just to make sure that we haven't missed something, right? Especially if you haven't responded to bladder therapy. Oh, I was, I was working with somebody a couple days ago and no bladder treatments worked. None of them worked. Zero, zip, nada, no relief. But this person also had no diet sensitivity. I was like, you know, wait a second. So when is, when is your pain the worst? Before you pee or after you're done peeing? They go, I don't have pain. But you're diagnosed with IC and you don't have pain. Okay. What, when are your symptoms the worst? When do you feel the need to pee more frequently, before you pee or after you're done peeing? And they kind of think about it and they go, well, it has nothing to do with my bladder wall getting full. It's more afterwards. And it's like, okay, now wait a second. Wait a second here. If your bladder wall were injured, you would have pain as your bladder filled with urine that would be relieved by urination. And the best way for me to, let me see if I, where's my pictures? What are my pictures, baby? Let's see. Here they are. Okay. So how do we know the bladder wall is driving your pain? The number one symptom is pain and discomfort as your bladder fills with urine that is relieved by urination. So the fuller you get, the worse you feel. And as soon as you pee and empty your bladder, there is a sense of relief. It's like, oh, thank goodness, thank goodness I found a bladder, woo, woo, I feel better. Now you might only feel better for a couple of minutes, but if you have that sense of relief after you urinate, then that tells, I mean, before you, I mean, after you're done urinating, 
then that tells us that your bladder wall might be part of the problem. And it makes sense when you look at this. So look at there. These are pictures of Hunter's lesions. Okay, these are the, the worst of the worst when it comes to kind of bladder wall, bladder wall irritation and damage. So a Hunter's lesion is known for what we call a stellate appearance. It's got a center red spot with a lot of red lines emerging from it. Now imagine, as your bladder gets fuller with urine, full, 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 urine gets into the lesion. It hurts bad right? It hurts bad. And then when you pee, bam, no more urine is touching the lesion. That's why you feel better. Or for those of you who have a bladder wall injury, like from chemotherapy or from having a terrible diet uh, or estrogen atrophy, something at all like that, that's what this bladder is. That's what this bladder looks like. Kind of looks like a, it looks like you've fallen and skin your knee, right? You know, if you fall and skin your knee, you have a lot of little wounds on your bladder. I mean, on your knee. Well, this is kind of what we see in the bladder for people with a bladder wall injury. So again, imagine urine filling this wound, right? I mean, filling your, filling your bladder. The fuller it gets, the more urine finds these red spots and gets into these red spots and ca causes pain and discomfort. And then bam, as soon as you pee, no urine touching the wound, you should feel a little bit better. So let's get back to this patient I was working with. Diagnosed with IC, had no bladder sensitivity at all with, with bladder filling, had no pain, could eat anything, had no problems with food. I was like, well, who, who on earth diagnosed you with IC? Those, you don't have any of the classic symptoms we see with somebody with some sort of bladder wall injury. And, you know, that's, I don't remember what their answer was, but when we started talking about it and kind of getting into it, what I kept saying is, you know, listen, clearly your bladder wall is in pretty good shape. If you have no pain as your bladder fills, no symptoms as your bladder fills, then your, your bladder wall is probably not the problem. The problem might be outside of the bladder, that the bladder is the secondary victim of another issue like endometriosis, like a fibroid tumor, like a pelvic floor injury, or black mold in your home. If you have black mold in your home, guess what? Urinary frequency is a well-known side effect of black mold exposure. Or, or the other thing, this was something that I learned I thought was absolutely fascinating, pelvic congestion syndrome. So, and I, again, I was working with a patient just the other day who had this and she, they found it in her twenties and she had a hysterectomy uh, just of her uterus in her twenties because of the pelvic congestion syndrome. So what is that? It is basically varicose veins, really large veins in your pelvis. And for men, it's called varicocele. Now, unfortunately, these veins are so large that blood flow is not good. And in one research study, they showed that blood flow to the bladder in somebody with uh, pelvic congestion syndrome was um, less than 50%, like 40%. The bladder is normally served by 24 units of blood. In pelvic congestion syndrome, it was nine units of blood. So I'm gonna ask you, how can the bladder be healthy if it doesn't have good blood supply? It's not, it's gonna have a hard time healing itself. It's gonna, it's just gonna have a, a hard time being oxygenating, getting nutrition. Blood flow is essential. Now, so Stacy, our writer, um, uh, she's a IC patient, is a fabulous writer. So she and I write most of the stuff for the IC network. Um, she ended, ended up interview, interviewing um, one of the top pelvic congestion uh, specialists in the United States. And his, I wanted to read you his quote here. Hold on. So he now believes this researcher, so, and, and you got, 
for those of you who get our magazine, it's on page 13 and page 14, he says, IC is perhaps not an inflammatory condition at all and is improved by various, uh, various treatments and is linked to the degree or severity of pelvic congestion syndrome. In other words, he thinks that in many patients, it's a blood flow, uh, con it's a blood flow congestion issue, right? That that blood flow matters. Now, of course, we have talked about that before because we also know that if you have tight dysfunctional muscles, you're also going to have terrible blood flow. Um, and so we forget that the bladder can be the secondary victim of other problems in the pelvis. Donna says, oh, uh, is pelvic congestion syndrome hard to diagnose? Not at all. You just have to have a special radiologist do it. Hello, Marianne from Sweden. Hello, hello, hello. I am half Swedish and half Norwegian. So it's very nice to see you, Marianne. So um, anyway, uh, again, for those of you who are diagno newly diagnosed, we've got to rule other stuff out, especially, especially if you're not responding to bladder therapy. Your ability to walk into your doctor's office and describe your symptoms in depth is critical here. It's absolutely critical. Please do not be one of those patients who say, hey, it hurts down there. You got to do better than that. You have to do better than that. You've got to be able to describe where your pain is. Is it low in your belly? Is it high in your belly? Is it to the left? Is it to the right? Is it in front? Is it in back? Is it outside of your body, on your skin, on your vulva, on your testicles? Is it inside, deep inside of your body? Could it be in your vagina? Your ability to describe these symptoms is critical. Now, the other bombshell that I dropped in my newsletter um, you know, I, I, and I got to tell you, the, the newsletters always take me quite a bit of time to write. You know, my job is to try to, oh gosh, come on. My chair is being so weird right now. Okay, stop it, chair. My chair is, keeps getting stuck under my desk. So the other kind of mini bombshell I dropped in, uh, that, in the newsletter I sent out last night is the fact that we now have our first American-based study that has found virus in the urine of IC patients. And that the viruses that they found exacerbated symptoms, that pac some patients in flares had more virus in their urine. So let me, let me just kind of break this down for you. I mean, obviously, obviously, anytime somebody has the symptoms of frequency, urgency, pressure, pain, we're always gonna think infection first, always. But the mistake that we make is we always think bacterial infection, but guess what? You can have a fungal infection or you could also have a viral infection. An example of a bacterial infection would be a typical you know, uh, E. coli infection. Or if you've had Lyme disease, they have found the Borrelia bacteria actually in the bladders of patients who have Lyme disease. So we know bacterial infections can happen. We certainly know that fungal infections can happen. And in fact, it was our own MAP research network that found urine of patients with IC, especially patients who were flaring. And this makes total sense to me because if there's ever anybody who has been overexposed to antibiotics, it's gonna be, it's gonna be us. It's gonna be the lower urinary tract patients. Um, but it was, it you know, and so the whole viral thing came up you know, about 10 years ago, really in Europe first, we had a couple of uh, researchers in Europe who found the polyoma BK virus and the Epstein-Barr virus in patients with Hunter's lesions. But, you know, the American researchers were awfully quiet. You know, they were awfully quiet about this. And now I know why they were quiet because they were doing their own research study. And so the MAP Research Network, the premier IC um, pelvic pain research network in the United States actually did a long detailed viral study of the urine of IC patients. Now, understand that the MAP Research Network is a very large research network. It's got six locations around the United States. They have a really big, strong, robust community of IC patients that are helping them with various research studies. And they have a really good supply of IC urine. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there you go. There you go. You, you wouldn't 
think about somebody actually keeping urine, but you know what they do, they study urine. And so they um, found uh, 10 patients, five men and five women who had, um, who were in the upper 50% in severity. So they didn't pick the mild patients, they took the more severe patients. And each patient of these 10 patients gave five urine samples. They gave one at the first visit, at six months, at a year. And then they had a home visit, a home sample uh, without a flare and a home sample with a flare. And at least one of the urine samples collected in the study at the research center was also, also done during a quote unquote flare period. So the first thing they did is next generation urine testing. And next generation urine testing is something that we're all talking about now. That's what is helping us identify much more accurately infections in the bladder, uh, infections in urine. Um, and that study confirmed the presence of human polyomaviruses. Now, polyomaviruses, this is not a sexually transmitted disease. This is, a, this is a virus we all have. This is a normal part of what we call the, the virome. We've got the biome. We also have the virome. And that are, these are the viruses that live in our body anyway. So this study found human polyomavirus in the urine of, of about, I'm going to say, Let's see, they found two different types. They found, found polyoma JC and poly, polyoma BK in over 20% of the patients that they were looking at. And that's a really, really big number, guys. It's a real 20%, that's a pretty big number. And the cool part of next generation testing is it allows them to identify DNA and RNA. So uh, uh, RNA is messenger RNA. RNA is part of, of, of growth, for, for lack of a better term, that the DNA splits. It, it, I, I don't even ask me. I'm not back in college yet. I'm just going to tell you that RNA is, is found when cells are changing and growing. And so what they found is both the DNA and the RNA of polyoma JC. So what that means is they believe that it, active infection was happening. And then they found the DNA of polyoma BK, but they did not find the RNA of polyoma BK. And there's a couple of points of the study that are a little bit complex for me, honestly, like I had to read it four or five times over a couple of days. It's very, very detailed. And, and genetics was not my strong suit when I was, uh, when I was in college. Um, I will just say that what it led them to conclude is that yes, indeed, chronic lifelong viral infections could be at play in some patients. Certainly not everyone. Listen, listen, people, no broad strokes here. We're not making any broad strokes. We know that the largest subtype of IC happens after injury. But there may be some of you, a little bit of you, who might actually have a viral infection. And we already have one research study that tested an antiviral on IC patients, specifically targeting polyomaviruses with success. So this is now, you know, again, how many times do we have to break the mold here about our perceptions of IC? Uh, you know, we're not thinking long-term incurable bladder infection, just like we're not thinking, you know, uh, long-term incurable viral infection for everyone. We no broad strokes here, but it's all about nuance. Not everybody's the same. This community is incredibly diverse. For some of you, IC begins in childhood. For others, IC begins after menopause. For some of you, IC begins after chemotherapy. Well, for others, I see begins after you've fallen and broken your tailbone. You are not the same. There is tremendous diversity in this patient population. And this is why a one treatment fits all approach does not work. 
And this is why something like Elmeron does not work for the majority of people who do it, because that means you probably don't have a bladder wall issue. You could have something else going on. So you, in fact, are an anatomical mystery to be solved. You are the detective leading the research team. You are the boss. You pay them. They don't pay you. Your job is to get them to study your body. What I always say, please, when you go for a second opinion, do not walk in and say you've got IC. Walk in and describe your symptoms. Your goal is to get them to study your body. Get them to study your body. So again, I was working with another patient last week who had had, you know, here again, diagnosed with IC, bladder therapies didn't work. And she didn't tell anybody that she had suffered a terrible pelvic trauma, like a really, really bad pelvic trauma that, that, I, it either broke her tailbone or, or did something. No, 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 no. It broke her sacrum. It broke her sacrum. And she hadn't told anybody about that. And it's important that you share that information with your doctors so that we can find the right treatment for you. The right treatment for you. Today, it's about an individualized treatment plan. Okay? So there you go. That is my little, my little bit of lecture. So one of you said, I need a cure for this. Now, listen, my friends, you don't cure an injury, you heal an injury. So if your symptoms began after having a baby, if your symptoms began after you fell, if your symptoms began uh, because you were an athlete, you don't cure that, you heal that. This is about creating an environment to support healing. If you have a flare because you drank soda or you drank a coffee, I was talking with a guy who literally didn't drink water for a decade and his bladder was a mess, an absolute mess. And he was continuing to drink one cup of coffee a day. And it's like, dude, seriously, the bladder cannot heal itself if you keep pouring acid on it. It's about creating an environment to support healing. The disease process, if there is a disease process, it is in Hunter's lesions. And it is in that small group of people who might have a chronic bacterial or fungal or viral infection, but that is a very, very small part of this patient population. All right, hold on a sec. So let me, whoops, whoops, whoops. Okay, <laughs> don't scare me Facebook, oh my God. So Linda says, um, something barely keeps your pain at the minimum. You hate this disease. It has ruined your life. So Linda, what I would love to know is what is your subtype? Do you know what your subtype is? Donna says, what do you think of microgen testing? Microgen testing is the bomb, my friends. Microgen testing, next generation DNA urine testing is what is revealing all these new facts about IC and these facts about finding viruses and fungi and other things. And I am in complete support of doing next generation urine testing from Microgen Diagnostics. There's another company that does it too, just because it's data. It's data. If you keep thinking that you have infection, if you keep self, because every time you flare, you think you have infection, I say, prove it, prove it have a next gen test. Not only will that tell you if you have infection, it will tell you if you have a drug resistant infection and it will tell you what the correct therapy is. Because if you're self-medicating from the antibiotics you got sitting in your bedside table, that's not gonna get you anywhere other than possibly developing a yeast infection and or future drug resistant infections. Get the test, get the proof, get it in writing. Let's see what it is. I had, in my first five years with IC, I got to say, I had urine tests, mm, at least the first year I had a urine test every month. And the second year, I probably had a urine test every two or three months. Every time I flared, I had a urine test. I never had a positive urine culture. Never, never. And now we know why, because my subtype is different. My subtype is different. I, do, I did not have an infectious subtype. I had an injury from a pool accident. Ar Arlene says, I moved from Petaluma to Tampa and I mentioned to my new doctor that I had IC. She threw her hands in the air and said, oh, you will always have that. End of story. 
have had it for 55 years and at least Kaiser cared. Yeah. Hey, hey, Arlene, listen, if you were part of Kaiser here in the North Bay, because Petaluma is just south of us, uh, we actually, Dr. Klein was the best urologist in the Kaiser system in the nation. He was my urologist who diagnosed me. And uh, he's retired now, but oh my God, we were so blessed to have him, to have really compassionate doctors uh, uh, caring for us up here in Northern California. Cynthia says, I really need help. The doctor hasn't even prescribed me anything, but told me to take aloe vera and pre-leave. I'm trying to conceive as well, but sex is painful and it's my worst triggers. Any suggestions? So Cynthia, anytime, so normally the reason why, okay, hold on. Okay, like seriously, my desk is weird and my, everything's shaking. What, what the heck? Okay. The reason why sex is usually painful is because you have tight muscles, tight muscles. If you've had tight muscles your entire life, and if sex has always been somewhat uncomfortable and painful for you, or if you're one of those women, you hate going to the OBGYN because having that speculum inserted in there is always painful. That usually means you've got vaginismus. That means you've got tight dysfunctional pelvic floor muscles. And so again, that is IC subtype three pelvic floor driven, which I believe is the largest subtype for IC. So we need to know number one, what is the health of your pelvic floor? Have you had a pelvic floor assessment? And the fact that sex is your worst trigger, that again is points directly to your muscles. So, and let me explain that here. When we think about IC and we think about IC in men and women, and we think about the pain with intimacy, right? A man with tight pelvic floor muscles and pelvic pain syndrome, their worst pain is gonna happen at the moment that they ejaculate because that is when they have a really strong, violent pelvic floor spasm, which is obviously about helping sperm, you know, get to the other side. In a woman, we often will, you know, sex can be more comfortable. Orgasm is usually more comfortable, but it's a couple of hours after sex that the flare begins. And that is because in a woman, we go through about 24 to 36 to 48 hours of very gentle pelvic floor spasms, which I think are all about our body helping sperm the egg. And so it's a very, very normal for somebody with a pelvic floor issue to have, uh, for a woman with pelvic floor issue to have a flare after intimacy. Normally what a doctor would tell you to do is they would, they would tell you to do heat because heat relaxes muscle, but they would also maybe give you something like a vaginal Valium suppository to insert vaginally so that you can get a muscle relaxant exactly to the area that needs it. Or they might even prescribe an oral muscle relaxant like Flexeril or Valium, or probably the most popular one is Baclofen, B-A-C-L-O-F-E-N, because Baclofen is non-sedating and you can take it during the day. Okay, so Cynthia, Question number one is, what is the health of your pelvic floor? Maddie says, thank you so much for spreading awareness. Girl, I love my job and we are in this together, right? Julianne says, I've been trying to get off Elmeron also because my vision has been getting blurry. Excellent, Julianne. That is what all the researchers say, all the eye doctors and the IC clinicians say, that if you are showing any signs of eye disease, it is important that you get off of Elmeron. Um, uh, and I can get into that if, uh, if we need to. Um, but hold on, something just attracted my attention here. Sharon says, I desperately need next gen testing. How long, how long do I need to be off of a long-term maintenance dose of an antibiotic before I do the test? I don't know, hun. You got to call the company, call microgen, microgendx.com. Call them and ask. I don't know. Um, let me show you guys a couple of pictures. Um, hold on a sec. So I have the original articles that were published about the Elmeron eye disease. 
Oh, here. Uh, oh, duh, it's right on top. <laughs> so, um, it was researchers at the Emory Eye Institute at Atlanta who, um, a little less, no, it's actually two years ago, exactly two years ago, published a paper in the Journal of Ophthalmology in which they believe that they had found a new eye disease related to the use of pentosin polysulfate, also known as Elmeron. Um, but of course, urologists don't read eye journals. <laughs> Believe me, you know, we barely, uh, you know, oh, for all of us, how often do we have time to read? Hardly at all, except in bed right before you go to bed. Um, and for doctors, all the journals that are being thrown at them, it's just nothing short of astonishing. So there's no way that a urologist would read an eye journal. There's just no freaking way. And so they wanted to get the attention of the urology community. And so they sent a letter to the Journal of Urology. And that's what got this whole bandwagon started. Um, and so I now I have here, this is the first paper that they published, the very first paper, pigmentary maculopathy associated with the chronic exposure to pentose and polysulfate. And I just wanted to show you a couple of the pictures of what they see. And these are time-lapse pictures, okay? So look at this. This is at the first appointment. These are different types of retinal exams. This is at a later appointment and you can clearly see the eye damage getting worse. And this is at a much later appointment and you can clearly, again, see this eye damage, these cells on the retina changing over time with Elmeron use. The big question though was, is this progressive? Is this progressive damage? Let me see, hold on. Uh, um, let me see if I can. I don't, I don't know if you'd be able to see this as well. Uh, look at this picture here. This is a three-dimensional picture of the retina. And I don't know if you can see all these little white spots in it, right? All these little white spots here that are worsening over time. That, that, those are also diseased retinal cells. And, and you can definitely see these changing. So the question is, is, is this retinal damage uh, um, uh, progressive? And the answer is, well, yeah, clearly, the longer you use it, the greater the risk. The longer you use it, the greater the risk. There's no doubt about that. Um, but we had a case study published by Harvard Medical School, an ophthalmologist at Harvard Medical School, that did indeed find that at least in one patient, the, disease, the, eye, the retinal disease progressed massively over time, even after stopping the medication. So they had a case study of one patient who six years later, seven years later, the eye damage was still progressing from, they believe, the uh, Elmeron exposure. And so it is, It is, in my opinion, in the opinion of every urologist out there and every ophthalmo, well, not urologist, every ophthalmologist working on this, that it is important that you get off the Elmeron if you're showing any signs of eye issue. Again, we have now four federal cases about that. You as patients, if you have eye, eye damage and you can show proof that you have used Elmeron may be able to participate in some of this litigation, this class action or tort litigation. I have the interview with the attorney of record for those four cases over on the IC network right now. Shannon says, I was pain free for a month just and just got a flare so bad I had to leave work and I still have it. The pain is a day later, I have been looking for something for pain. So um, Shannon, remember uh, remember that it's not just about pain medicine, it's about trying to figure out what's triggering your pain. If you're having a pelvic floor uh, flare, you, your focus has to be on relaxing those muscles. And so you're gonna use heat, you're gonna get, put your feet up, you're, you're gonna use a muscle relaxant, you might need to stretch, do your exercises that a physical therapist might have given you to try to bring the pain down. If it's a bladder wall flare from you doing something like drinking a coffee or something like that, then this is what you've got to do. You number one, dilute your urine. We want to dilute your urine to get rid of the irritants in your urine. Number two, it's important to perhaps alkalinize your urine. Uh, that means we're going to try to re reduce acid levels so that it's not so irritating and provocative. You can do that with pre 
Preleaf is one way that you can alkalinize your urine, or you can take a Tums, or you can take a little tiny bit, quarter teaspoon of baking soda in a big glass of water. Do not do more. Tiny, tiny amounts. Be moderate here, guys. We do not go out to town with baking soda because it's sodium and it can raise your heart. It can raise your blood pressure. So this is not, more is never better in this circumstance. But you'll find some of the oldest books on IC have talked about using a quarter teaspoon of baking soda in a glass of water once a day. Maybe don't do it all the time. And please don't drink alkaline water all day, every day. That can be just as harmful as drinking acid water. But the go-to for many people is Preleaf. Preleaf has been around for over 30 years. They're actually the sponsor of this meeting. I've worked with this company since I started the IC Network 27 years ago. It is considered, it is the most well-known supplement called calcium glycerophosphate. Of course, you don't eat any supplement like candy, including Preleaf, because it is calcium. And the calcium has to go somewhere. And we don't want you to get kidney stones. If you do a lot of calcium, you could end up with kidney stones. So moderation is key. You take one or two pills before you eat, right? Or one, or one pill if you think you have a flare to alkalinize. Talk to your doctor about it. Your doctor might have other opinions for you, but Preleaf has been around for a long time. Marlene says, hey, I have Elmeron, uh, Elmeron and bladder installations, not whirly. Should I still be concerned about the eye issues? Not as much. Not as much because, um, you know, the question is, is how much Elmeron from your bladder reaches your bloodstream to circulate throughout your body? Right. And so we don't, we, you know, when you take something, it, the cool thing about the bladder wall is it's actually really hard to get stuff through. So, I mean, that's the whole point is the purpose of the bladder wall is to keep toxins confined in urine and not let them distribute throughout the body. And that's why delivering medication to the bladder is hard because you've got these giant cells on the urothelium with very, very tight junctions. So it's really hard for medica medication to get through the bladder wall into the deeper tissue. So generally doing a bladder installation would not pose the same risk. One of the ways they do try to get medication across the bladder wall is by alkalinizing it. If they put a little bit of baking soda in or sodium bicarbonate in bladder installations, that changes the pH enough that allows it that allows there to be a little bit of absorption. But yes, generally, generally uh, using Elmeron in a bladder installation would be much safer than taking it orally with respect to your eyes. The same is true for estrogen and breast cancer. You know, I mean, if you're taking oral estrogen, that estrogen is being distributed everywhere. That's why oral estrogen has been linked to all sorts of cancers. But when you use estrogen topically, much less of it enters your bloodstream. So it's considered much safer. And you can look at Google it, do the research on it, Google topical estrogen safety, and you can see the studies for yourself. Linda says, hold on. Linda says, they have tried me on everything. Nothing has helped, suggested Botox, but would have to use a catheter to empty the bladder, still undecided on this. So Linda, again, you are a true anatomical mystery to be solved. I would love to talk to you, hon. If you're gonna come on over to our Zoom meeting at two Pacific time, maybe we can bring you live and you can tell us a little bit more about that. But I would love to talk to you this week if you're interested in talking, because again, there may be something else triggering your bladder symptoms. We see this all the time. Stacy says, I was diagnosed with endometriosis and adenomyosis prior to IC and pelvic floor dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Shannon says, I had Botox a month ago and I didn't need a catheter. You only need it if you're not peeing on your own. Uh, the risk of Botox, the reason why I see, I mean, by Botox is in step four of the IC treatment options is because it does come with a pretty significant risk, and that is urinary retention. If they accidentally numb the nerve that controls your ability to pee, you might not be able to be, pee on your own for a couple of weeks, and you might need to self-catheterize. That is why Botox is not meant to be used in people incapable of self-catheterizing like in somebody who's very elderly. Sarah says, could you please help? I'm pregnant and do for Botox, which I know I can't have. Is there anything else I can have? Uh, Sarah, we have a pregnancy resource center right over on the IC network. If you go to icnetwork.org, go in there. We, can, we share a couple of successful 
Um, I see pregnancies. I see, I see patients have babies all the time. You're going to be an awesome mom. I have no doubt about it. But during pregnancy itself, obviously picking therapies is, cha is challenging. We can't do things that are dangerous, especially in the first trimester. There's only one research study done by Dr. Deborah Erickson at the University of Kentucky who actually looked at IC therapies with respect to the risk of uh, to the risk to a fetus. And I have a link to that in that in our Pregnancy Resource Center. I would suggest that you buy that article, not from us. It's, it's not our article. It's in a major journal. And unfortunately, it's not free. Um, but I would suggest that you spend the 20 bucks and buy that article so that you can give it to your obst obstetrician so you guys can look at the pros and cons of therapies. As an example, what she said in there is that... Um, uh, doing a heparin installation, a heparin lidocaine installation might be okay as long as you don't use the sodium bicarbonate because we don't want the medication to cross through the bladder where it might reach the fetus. And so please, please, please buy that article so that you can talk to your doctor about it. And in the meantime, the other challenge that we see with pregnancy is finding a good uh, prenatal vitamin that won't irritate your bladder. That's really challenging. Um, I am not aware of a true low acid uh, prenatal vitamin. Um, and so I can't really recommend a vitamin to you. Uh, you have to talk to your doctor about that. I will tell you though, that we do have a low acid multivitamin, but I cannot say, nor should I say it's safe for pregnancy. I don't know of any low acid vitamin that's, that has been rated safe for, for pregnancy. Okay. So you got to talk to your doctor about that. Stephanie, holy hell girl, two weeks out from a hysterectomy, still have pain. Girl, I feel it. It was, I had my hysterectomy two years ago on May 23rd. And uh, are you still walking like this? This is what I did after my, I, I just walk like this. <laughs> I mean, listen, re recovering from a, from a hysterectomy is cannot, it is challenging. It is hard and you're going to have, you're going to have muscle tension. You're going to have a lot of muscle tension, pelvic floor muscle tension for months. Uh, at least I did. And so using a muscle relaxant, something like Flexeril actually might be uh, useful. Uh, that's what got me through my hysterectomy recovery. Talk to your doctor about it. Hello, Mihaela from Romania. Nice to see you. Welcome to the meeting. Cynthia says, has CBD, CBD helped anyone here? Cynthia, I will tell you that the IC network ran the longest medical marijuana CBD study on our website in our survey center. And CBD has helped uh, thousands of patients uh, over the years. And I have published that data in our magazine. Uh, we go through it occasionally. Absolutely, we're trying. The only thing I, I tell pa patients about CBD is it's, a, it's very, very important that you buy organic CBD Anything organic, uh, whether it be um, medical marijuana or hemp, it should be organic. And the company should have testing results on their website to verify, absolutely verify it's not contaminated with pesticides and fungicides. Let's see. Rhonda says, I'm in such a horrible flare. I've tried to ease the pain, including going to the ER today for a Toradol shot. I don't know what else to do. Rhonda, we, ha uh, Rhonda, we have a flare management guide over on our website. All you need to do is sign up for our free uh, newsletter. And uh, your gift for signing up for that free newsletter is our 40-page flare management guide that gives you hour-by-hour -hour rescue plans. Our challenge, though, is we have to figure out what kind of flare you're having. Is it a bladder wall flare or a pelvic floor flare? That's a big thing. Can you tell us what you think triggered your flare? You guys are talking about CBD gummies. I don't have anything. To, I don't know anything about CBD gummies. Shannon says soaking in a hot bath helps because that relaxes muscle.
Mihaela says, I have a sting in my bladder and a sting when I urinate and I have no diagnosis. I was diagnosed a few years ago with fungal cystitis who saw it on a cystoscopy, but the urine ablation is always negative. Well, urine, why would you do urine? Why would you ablate the bladder for a fungal infection? Normally for a fungal infection, you would treat it with an antifungal medication and you would have to modify your diet so that you're not eating things that feed the fungus like sugar and carbs. Listen, if you're somebody who flares whenever you eat sugar or carbs, you probably have a candida infection in your urine because candida feeds on uh, sugar. And so if you notice your symptoms get worse when you eat carbs, then there's a very good chance you have a candida infection. And a big part of treating candida infections is you have to stop feeding it. Beth says, what about hormones and menopause? Pain gets much more intense the week before my period. I'm 53 perimenopausal. Is perimenopause a subtype for IC? Yes. Perimenopause is a sub-subtype of IC subtype 2, bladder wall driven. When we think about the, the ways that the bladder wall can be compromised in some patients, there are three key subtypes. Chemical injury, estrogen atrophy, chronic infection. Those are the three prim primary variants for people who have some sort of issue with your bladder wall because your bladder wall, like any other part of the body, can be injured. Usually it's injured through some sort of chemical exposure. But as you get older, one of the other things that happens is as your estrogen levels drop, your bladder wall gets thinner and it's not able to protect itself as well. You notice that because your vulva gets dry, your vagina gets dry, you may have been able to eat or drink certain things in your 30s and 40s that all of a sudden in your 50s hurt. They just hurt. That's not a disease that's aging, that is estrogen atrophy. So if your vulva is dry and your vagina is dry, then the odds are so is your urethra and so is your bladder. Um, and so uh, the ther therapy for that is going to be potentially using a topical estrogen, because if you give your skin estrogen, your skin will start to produce mucus. And that's good. You're giving your body what it needs to produce that nice, thick, protective coating. That's important. But you might also benefit from something that has the coating effect. And since Elmeron is so risky now, many patients are turning instead to supplements that contain chondroitin. And let me get those. So these supplements, the chondroitin-based supplements that patients often turn to are going to be bladder builder, bladder rest, cystoprotec, and cystureno. Now we also have a new aloe supplement called Allopath that should be here in a couple of weeks. Really excited about that one because that's taking aloe to the next level. It's making it incredibly, very, very soothing to the urinary tract. And so that also might be helpful for somebody with estrogen atrophy. So that is an organic anthraquinone free aloe combined with calcium, magnesium, and more importantly, palmitoethanolamide for pain reduction. So when allopath comes out, we're going to be really excited about that. Joanna says, why is Elmeron so expensive? Because it, when it went off patent, the company raised the price, uh, went off patent, I think about 10 years ago. Uh, UC San Diego owned the patent to Elmeron. Uh, a staffer there let it lapse accidentally. They didn't renew it when they should have. And I know that because they called me and asked me to write a letter in support of them getting the patent back, which I did at that time. Um, but they were not able to retrieve the patent. And so now it is uh, available for generic production. And so the brand name company, uh, Johnson & Johnson, I believe raised the price. I, I believe they did it because they wanted to make as much money as they could off of, off of it before a generic medication came out. That's my theory. They didn't tell me that. That's, that's my theory and my guess because that's what most companies do. I don't know. Johnson & Johnson is very quiet. They don't. Janssen Pharmaceuticals, Johnson & Johnson, they don't, they don't tell us anything and they haven't for years. And so it's very, it's just impossible to know, 
you know, what's, what's going on with that. They haven't even made a statement about the pigmentary macul maculopathy yet. And it's been two years. Joanna says, what causes pelvic congestion syndrome and IC? Uh, pelvic congestion syndrome, I think is there's quite a, a, a strong genetic influence with pelvic congestion syndrome. And our article talks about that. Um, and interstitial cystitis has many, many, many potential causes. And pelvic congestion syndrome, I think, could be caused by injury, by trauma, straining, things like that. Think about what causes varicose veins. Let's see, Mahela says, I have a fungal infection. Mahela, there's a very good book called The Yeast Connection in Women. I mean, the assumption is that you probably have a candida infection. So getting that uh, tested and checked, it would be, would be meaningful. Danielle says, does anyone here take thyroid? I take, I take thyroid. I've taken thyroid. I've been at low thyroid when I was like 21. I've taken it for almost 40 years now because I'm that old. I only do brand name. I only do brand name Synthroid. Every other thyroid I've ever tried has really messed me up bad. I get really weird reactions to generic ones. Kathleen says, "Thank you for discussing pelvic congestion. I'm going to see a radiologist specialist due to left leg swelling, more at the ankle for over a year now. I and I question also if this could be a reason for emptying my bladder and have to cath myself three to four times per day." Um, it could be, I mean, Kathleen, you are absolutely an anatomical mystery to be solved. Um, I mean, they need to step, they need to study your body. They need to study your pelvis. They need to study your muscles. They've got to look for prolapses, anything at all like that, which could make it difficult for you to empty. Jessica says, what if you have bilirubin in your urine? I don't know, hon. Rachel says, I noticed soon after I got my IC, my tailbone began hurting. Mm -hmm. Chantel says, what about men having uh, helicobacter pylori and then getting diagnosed with IC? Helicobacter pylori is, a, is the bacteria that's found in the stomach that is usually caused by, that usually causes stomach ulcers. I don't believe that they've ever found that in the urinary tract. I don't know. Jennifer says, two questions. Is, I, is IC progressive? Will it get worse over time? And it's IC hereditary. Uh, so, um, while some doctors have said that they thought that IC could be progressive, when you look at the subtypes, it's really clear that in many cases it's, it's not as long as you act, as long as you identify it correctly and take action here. I mean, seriously, if you have Hunter's lesions and the Hunter's lesions have never been treated, yeah, you're going to get worse you're gonna get worse. Hunter's lesion require lesion-specific therapy, lesion-specific therapy. Uh, Elmeron would do nothing for a Hunter's lesion. Such supplements would do nothing for a Hunter's lesion. With Hunter's lesion, you've got to get in and treat the lesion. Um, and so, yeah, if you have untreated Hunter's lesions, you are gonna get progressively worse until they get treated correctly. If you have tight pelvic floor muscles that are restricting blood flow in your bladder and you do nothing about it, yeah, you're gonna probably get worse. The muscles are just gonna get tighter and tighter and tighter. But here's the thing, when you start doing the right therapies, generally patients improve. That usually, and I don't remember the research study, it was quite a while ago. What that study said is that patients usually hit their worst in their first six months, and then they start to improve. And they start to improve because they're now doing the correct therapies and diet and stuff like that. Uh, Joanna says, what is end-stage IC? End-stage IC it, it only happens to a very, very small population of patients. It's when the bladder, the bladder itself is just profoundly damaged and scarred. You know, your bladder is, is like a balloon. It's, it's small, it starts small, and then it slowly fills with urine. And then when you urinate, it gets small again. And just its ability 
to expand and contract mechanically is so interesting. How do the cells do that? I think it's absolutely fascinating. But a bladder that is profoundly badly damaged, like in a patient who uses ketamine, ketamine is the equivalent of an industrial solvent, devastating to the bladder. What happens is the bladder loses its ability to expand. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. That would be considered end stage. And it is only at that point, really, that anybody would consider doing any sort of surgery. And again, remember, that's for a very, 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 very small group of patients. Usually, usually we can understand why that best happened. Usually there's some sort of trauma that helps us understand why that happened or why that developed over time. Gina says, I appreciate all of your information. Thank you. Okay, Deanna says, mine has grown increasingly worse over the past two years. Lately, my flares feel like someone is jabbing a hot poker in my vagina. Okay, so Deanna, that's really an important symptom. Um, uh, I mean, so there are a couple of things that come to mind with that. Number one, pelvic floor dysfunction, pelvic floor injury is usually manifested with a vaginal burning sensation. So if you've got tight pelvic floor muscles, those tight pelvic floor muscles often cause vaginal burning. But the fact that you say hot poker, heat, heat makes us think about estrogen atrophy. Could you have very, very, very dry skin? that is just very, very compromised. If you feel urine burn as urine is crossing your vulva and it's really, really hot, that tells me that you've got estrogen atrophy. So you could have significant estrogen atrophy in your vagina that could be part of the problem. Or if your symptoms are positional in nature where you're fine when you stand, but when you sit down, it hurts, you could have a pudendal neuralgia. So there are three possible options for that scenario. Carry hope, my friend. Carry hope, my friend. Now we understand those, and all of those are treatable. Uh, Jennifer says, the doctor has me trying to retrain your bladder, which is not working, and they want you to go to physical therapy. Please, please go to physical therapy. Pelvic floor physical therapy is remarkably successful for IC, for IC-like symptoms. Can you, uh, Cecilia says, can I explain tailbone pain? Uh, pain when you sit, pain when you touch your tailbone, it hurts. Um, anybody else have ideas on how to explain it? I'm gonna have to start the Zoom meeting in about five minutes, just saying, I'm gonna turn that on in a minute. Cheryl says, I was using Prelief and it worked great, but I also read that people with kidney stones shouldn't use it. I wish I could take it. Oh, bummer. Then maybe you're going to be one of those people where you're going to have to use, you know, a little tiny bit of baking soda. Karen says, do most physical therapists do pelvic floor therapy? No. No, they have to be specially trained to do pelvic floor physical therapy. There's a website called Pelvic Guru that can help you find a good physical therapist. We also have a database on our website. It's a little bit older. Um, it's just a lowest on the totem pole of work to be done here in our office. Brett says, can digestive issues like severe bloating cause IC-like symptoms? I will tell you that severe bloating is common in some people with IC. We call it the IC belly. Um, and one doctor suggested that the swelling of the belly during flares is just showing inflammation. But we also know that there's kind of a pretty complex relationship between the bladder and the bowel. We know that if the bowel gets irritated, the nerves in the bowel are irritated, the nerves in the bladder can become irritated and vice versa. And so it's called neurocrosstalk. And so it's fairly common for IC patients to notice uh, that their symptoms get worse if there's something going on with their bowel. Uh, um, irritable bowel syndrome is fairly common. I did do, we did do a survey of IC patients about stomach distress and bloating uh, several years ago. And we found that many IC patients do have a variety of stomach issues like gastroparesis and gastritis. 
Uh, we can't make a causative association with that, though, because we just don't know enough. I mean, it could just be from the overuse of antibiotics messing up our biome. But the fact that you've got bloating isn't surprising. And I would, uh, if you'd like to talk this week, I'd be more than happy to talk to you, Brett. Hello, Deborah. The people who have IC are, and who get pregnant are okay. I see patients have babies all the time, all the time. Here, the challenge here is about half of them, their symptoms go away completely. It's amazing. In fact, one of my dearest friends, oh, old, old IC friends, who was in my local support group, she had terrible IC, terrible pain. And it was just, I mean, it just was agony for her until she got pregnant and then it all went away. And that helped us understand that her hormones, hormone dysfunction was driving a good portion of her quote unquote IC. Um, and so there's a significant group of IC patients who get pregnant and their symptoms go away completely. But there's also a significant group of patients whose symptoms get worse during pregnancy. And you've got to have a good IC toolkit to get you through that pregnancy if you're one of those people who do get a little bit worse. And again, we have a pregnancy resource center on our website. Marlene says, Elmeron installations are the only thing that help your hunter's lesions. Um, what they do, what an Elmeron installation would do is it, it was, it, I'm assuming it's Elmeron lidocaine, it would numb the nerves. And so it's not helping the lesion heal, it's just numbing the nerves so the nerves can't be quite so irritating. Hi, Marion. Hi, Cindy. Okay, guys, tell you what, let's take a break. Everybody, go use the restroom. I need to go use the restroom. Get a water break. Come back. I'm going to start up the Zoom meeting. I'm going to leave all three running for a little bit. Give me a moment, okay? You know, I had no idea I could talk so long and so fast. <laughs> That's just crazy. Sometimes I got to stop and take a break. Hold on. Joanna says, what muscle relaxer works best for spasms? Well, Joanna, it depends upon where your spasms are. If you're having bladder wall spasms, you need to do a smooth muscle relaxant like Ditropan or Detrol. If you're having a skeletal muscle spasm from your pelvic floor, you have to use a skeletal muscle relaxant like Baclofen or Flexeril or Valium. All right, let me start up this Zoom meeting. Started.
allow. Hold on. All righty then. Hello, Ruth. Ruth is. Okay, everybody. So, all right, guys. So I sent out the uh, invitation uh, in our email yesterday. Uh, and uh, I'm going to post it in Facebook mailing list anyway. All right, guys, here's the invitation. All right, where did Facebook go? Hold on. Where's my Facebook? There you are. <laughs> and so Janet's coming in. All right. All right, guys. So so we so we are not the Zoom meeting, we're just gonna be letting people in. It's not officially starting, but you're gonna be able to hear everything. I've got to manually allow people. I'm posting the Zoom link in Facebook right now. Let me know if you groups that many IC patients tend to have multiple inflammatory disorders. You know, Stacy, isn't th th this remains kind of kind of one of the unsettled areas of subtyping? And DJ says gastroparesis, girl, me too. That's why when we, I just took a Gaviscon because I'm feeling a little gastroparesis today. But anyway, Stacy, getting back to your questions. Yes, it's true. There are some patients who do have multiple inflammatory disorders or a small percentage of people have multiple autoimmune disorders. So for that small group of patients who've got IC, definitely a distinct subtype of IC that none of the big researchers right now are prepared to formalize. Prepared to formalize. Now, with respect to IC and IBS, what is that all about? And, and um, there's been some research that's talked about something called neural crosstalk, where, and I remember the first paper came out 10, 12 years ago, and they called it the pepperoni pizza algorithm. And what they did is they were able to prove through radioactive tracers that the nerves in the bowel and the nerves in the bladder merge uh, at the spinal cord and at actually at one point in time are in the, merge into the same nerve group. So they put radioactive tracers in the bladder, they put radioactive tractors, radioactive, different radioactive tracers in the bowel and they, uh, in the nerves, and then they watched it as it went up towards the spinal cord. And eventually those radioactive tracers were found in the same nerve group. And so there's been a lot of talk about neural crosstalk, neural crosstalk. And that is, um, can, the nerves of, uh, can the nerves of the bowel influence the nerves of the bladder? Can the nerves of the bladder influence the nerves of the bowel? And what they were able to prove in animal studies is when you, when the bowel nerves are irritated, the bladder nerves also become irritated and vice versa. When the bladder nerves are irritated, it looks like the bowel nerves were, will get irritated. But what's even all the more compelling is what Dr. Jerome Weiss talked about in his book, Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain, which is, where is it? So this is the bomb. This is the book. This is an amazing, awesome book, especially for patients who have a history of pelvis, pelvic injury. If you've got pain to the left of center, to the right, to the right of center, then we always, always, always want to look at other structures in the pelvis, specifically muscles. And he did a really good job in here uh, ex that explains... Um, how do I want to say this? Um, the viscerosomatic re visceral reflex. So the viscerosomatic reflex is, can an organ change a muscle? And the answer is, yeah. We certainly know that an organ can change muscle behavior. How? Because if you're in pain, your muscles get tight to protect you. That's a guarding reflex. 
that is called the guarding reflex. So we know an organ in the pelvis can change muscles in the pelvis, but it muscles can change organs. That is a somatovisceral reflex. And so the question is, is how does that happen? Well, if you have, let's say, let's say you fell. Let's say you had a hard fall. In fact, I, I got a big uh, bruise on my butt right now because I bumped into something. It was pretty hysterical. But let's consider the scenario of what happens when you fall on your tush. You suffer a compression injury. The weight compresses the muscles, right? It also compresses blood vessels. And that's what causes bruising. Is you, you fall, you suffer a traumatic injury to blood vessels. So blood vessels break, you get a bruise, bam. But you can also suffer a compression injury of nerves. And that is important. And hold on, I have to, you guys, you guys are muted on uh, Zoom right now. Uh, you're not unmuted yet. So, because uh, I'm, we're still doing the meetings on Facebook and YouTube. So, so getting back to this. When you suffer a compression injury, you damage, you damage muscle cells, you damage blood vessels, and you also potentially damage nerves. But one of the things that happens are trigger points. And trigger points are long-term uh, compression injuries where you've got a muscle fiber that is lumpy instead of smooth. It's lumpy and it's restricting blood flow. Uh, and it's also restricting nerve function. And he does a good job of explaining how those sick nerves that cannot function normally, how that sick functionality moves up to the spine and then back down to the bladder where it influences the bladder wall. So the question is, can a muscle change an organ? And the answer is yes. It's a somatovisceral reflex. You know, when you think about a bladder injury, we're always thinking, is it something from the outside coming in? It's something from the outside coming in, right? But guess what? It can also be something on the inside that's triggering that bladder wall to break down. And it was Dr. Thea Herides who first explained that to me 20 years ago in our lecture series. He said, don't underestimate the fact that the bladder wall can be broken down by other factors inside the body, such as nerve dysfunction. And we also know too that nerves are often involved with Hunter's lesions because when we silence the nerves, patients feel better, right? So anyway, great, great, great question. DJ says, I have been diagnosed with candida labrata. Hey girl, me too, I had it. Was told the only treatment is boric acid suppositories. I just had my hydrodescension and pelvic floor Botox. I was told that I have a seven, what? Okay. Okay. Got, uh, let me read this. Let, I, let, I, I got I to gotta read this. This is, this is really interesting. And as people are coming in to the um, Zoom meeting, I'm letting you guys in. Okay. But I have to do it one at a time so we don't get raided by the, the panty boys who came in last week and wanted to, you know, disrupt us. So if, if that, okay, if that, okay. So let me read DJ's message uh, here. DJ says, I have been diagnosed with candida labrata and was, the, was told the only treatment was boric acid suppositories. So, um, so DJ, we're gonna break it down into sections. You need to get the book, The Yeast Connection of Women or the book, The Yeast Connection because there's a lot more boric acid suppositories. When I, I had a two year candida labrata infection, we did gentian violet treatments. I mean, I was desperate. Hey man, listen, for those of you out there, you gotta understand fungal infections in the bladder can be agony. Funk, when I had a candida labrata infection in my urine, from overusing antibiotics, doing an old IC experimental protocol. Candida hurt way worse than typical IC. I was a, 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 a sniveling, sobbing, 
I can't even begin to tell you how bad it was. It was so bad. And I was at my, my OBGYN every week seeing different doctors begging for help. And I had doctors yelling at me saying, there's no way you have candida. And I was like, prove it, do a swab. Every single time I had it and I had candida labrata, which is one of the most drug resistant candida infections you can get. Um, so we did everything. I did extended Diflucan. I did very long courses of very, very heavy Diflucan. And if you look at the Diflucan drug information sheet, there is a little section that's, that specifically says there are some candida infections that will not respond to one or two pills. You have to do an extended series. And so we did extended series for my candida labrata. Uh, we did, I did boric acid suppositories. I have no memory of what they did. I do not believe that they helped. The biggest thing for me was removing all milk sugars. My candida labrata flared badly whenever I ate milk or ice cream. So I didn't eat milk or ice cream for years. And I still really don't very, very much. Um, and we even did gentian violet, an old, old therapy where they, they paint you purple. My little tender bits were painted purple and to kill any candida on the outside. And understand that candida doesn't just grow internally. You can have candida on your labia. You can have candida on your vulva. And so you have to make sure you treat that too. So that's part one of DJ's messages. Part two is you just had a hydrodistension and pelvic floor Botox. Okay. Part three is I was told that you have a seven centimeter clot or mass, but your urogynecologist was in there with a cystoscope and she didn't see anything, but she wanted me to get an MRI with contrast but I can't because of having endoscopic clips. Oh, you got to get that check, girl. You got to get that check. Seven centimeters, that's big. I mean, that's, I mean, this is once seven centimeters, you know, probably like this big. You got to get that check. We got to figure out what that is. So work with your doctor. And see if there's something else that they can do. Um, if you couldn't do, if you couldn't do the MRI, see if there's something else that they can do. But you got to get that figured out. The good news here is that it does is that they did a cystoscope and it wasn't something inside your bladder. So that's really really good news. So the question is, is it endometriosis or something on the outside of your bladder? It's possible. You had a hysteri hysterectomy at 33, six years ago. So the question then is, could it be scar tissue from the hysterectomy? And that's a possibility too, hun. That's a possibility too. So, okay, you guys, uh, for those of you on Zoom, we're still doing the, the, full, the full meeting on Facebook, on YouTube. So please just hang out. I will get to you. I, I promise, I promise, I promise, I promise. It's only two o'clock. Um, I wanna give people plenty of time to come in. Hello, Kathy. Robin says, what percentage of IC patients also have endometriosis? I think it's on our website in our endometriosis section. I don't remember off the top of my head. Mahela says, I took a candida treatment in the bladder, but I had no results. I have a few years since I have permanent stinging when urinating and when the sting worsens, I have it continuously. I also have vaginal bruises, but the tests are negative. Well, Vaginal bruises? Me, okay. So, so Mihaela, I know that you're uh, you're in Romania, right? So I'm not sure what testing you have available to you. It might it be it could be very interesting to do a next generation urine test. I know that Microgen here in the United States does work with people in other countries, and that would tell us once and for all if you do. The stinging is interesting. Um, if you have stinging in your urethra and stinging at the entrance to your vagina, look at the quality and health of your skin. If your vulva is dry and your vagina is dry, then so is your urethra and so is your bladder. And there is a good chance that you could have est estrogen atrophy. I will tell you, the only time I personally have had a stinging sensation was in my urethra as a result of estrogen atrophy. Um, and so where the stinging is happening is important. 
and I can't tell how old you are. Your picture is a little tiny, so I can't tell how old you are. The vaginal bruising, that's concerning. I don't understand what that is. I mean, could it be pelvic congestion syndrome? I don't know, maybe, but it could be something else too. I don't, I don't know. Stacy says, my symptoms were controlled for over a year. My daughter moved back home with her cat and it took two months to figure out that I was allergic to the cat. Oh, I'm so sorry. I was very ill and I've been in a terrible flare since December of 19. I think if my allergies go away, I will once again have significant relief. I just need to find an effective way to calm my body's inflammation. I'm just getting started, but the, but the recommended natural supplement is looking promising. Well, you know, you, if, you're, if you're looking at a supplement, you're going to be looking at something that would also contain quercetin because quercetin acts as an anti-inflammatory, antihistamine. It has an antihistaminic effect. You just want to get quercetin not derived from citrus. It has to be quercetin preferably derived from the Sephora plant. Um, and, um, you know, antihistamines, I mean, it would be interesting to see if Vistaril, also known as hydroxyzine or Atarax, which is a step two treatment options in the IC treatment protocol, um, those are antihistamines that are well known to help with allergies. And so it would be interesting to see if one of those would be helpful, because then you might have a benefit of two two-pronged approach. Not only would it potentially be helping your bladder, but it would also be helping your allergies. Lisa says, is anybody seeking a lawyer for Elmeron? A lot of patients are seeking lawyers for Elmeron right now. And if you come on over to our website, we have an interview with the, uh, the lawyer who has filed the first four cases. Her name is Stacy Hauer. And uh, you can contact her or you can contact, we have a couple of other law firms that we've worked with too. Website. Uh, icnetwork.org and look at that article. It's right on the front page uh, about the Q&A with the attorney. And we have another law firm that's also coming on that, that it looks like they're going to be a very strong force in it. All right. All right, so so right now we are we are doing a trifecta. We are broadcasting on Facebook. We are broadcasting on broadcasting on Zoom right there. So what we're going to do now is we are going to move over to the Zoom portion of the meeting, and and generally, I'm going to leave YouTube and Facebook up for a while. Um, so that you can, hold on, I just have to fix my computer here, uh, so that you can listen in, and I will still be looking at Facebook, but uh, what we're going to do is we're going to let the people in the Zoom meeting um, speak, and they're going to speak one at a time. Now, for those of you in Zoom, you have your choice of video, video broadcasting or not, and we'll do a little mini coaching, you know, just kind of see what's going on with you, if there's anything that's missing, et cetera, et cetera. So you'll have an opportunity to kind of see what I do when I work with patients on the phone or in coaching sessions. Now, understand with Zoom that sometimes I can see your names and sometimes I can't, and they're, it, it always reorganizes. So it's not like there's a specific order here, okay? And so bear with me if I don't get to you right away, nothing, don't take anything personal, okay? Doing my best. So I've got one person and I cannot see her name. Oh, Ruth. Hello, Ruth. How are you, my dear? How are you feeling today? Um, you know, today's not the best day, but I still have good attitude. I had been diagnosed 15 years ago and I have been in remission for years. Okay. And um, I recently, I don't know if this is making us the difference or not, but I recently went off Singular that I had been on for about five years thinking I didn't need it anymore. Not knowing Singular had pr probably many of the same properties as the hydroxyzine. Right. And so when I went off, I'm having the worst pain no. that I've had in years and years and years. So I did see a walk-in doctor who just started hydroxyzine, but a very small dose at my request. Okay. So oh. 
I'm interested in seeing what everybody else is up to and I don't have any relief at day two, but I know it takes time, so. So, so when did you stop the singular? Uh, about three weeks ago. And when did your flare start? Right away or? Well, it started small, but then it got really bad about a week ago. And what are your classic, what are your symptoms of your flare? Oh, like I feel like a sense of pressure constantly. Like I just want to have a baby. I just want to oh. bear down and push out a baby. Oh. And um, just lots of, um, lots of discomfort and pressure. and feels like the bladder's just in a spasm. So your symptom, it, it, it's not, let's see, how do I want to say this? Pressure is not a symptom that I normally associate with the bladder wall. Pressure is a symptom that I associate more with the pelvic floor. Right. As we know with pelvic congestion syndrome, and this was something that Stacy's article taught me, is that somebody with pelvic congestion syndrome, you're good in the morning, but as the day progresses, the pressure gets worse and worse and worse until by the end of the day, you feel like you're carrying a bowling ball around in your pelvis. And it can right. be very hard to walk. Does that sound similar for you? Um, probably, I did uh, contact a physiotherapy um, clinic here where I live who does apparently do pelvic floor work and I'm waiting to hear back from them. So I'm glad to hear you say that because um, it very well could be that that's the biggest problem. Well, I, I mean, you know, I, and the other thing that we also have to consider is, is estrogen atrophy, you yeah. know, that you, you may have just hit that point like I did a couple of years ago where your estrogen levels just got to the point where your bladder has become more sensitive and vulnerable. So I think, I think you've got a couple of things to rule out. I mean, could it be allergies? Sure. Except I don't normally associate pressure with allergies, but pressure is that really weird symptom. That's kind of sometimes how your brain interprets pain. Like for you, it's pressure where it's for me, it's pain. I don't. So pressure has always been kind of a fairly ubiquitous syndrome. I mean, symptom. I, if you have a, do you have a downward sensation, like something's falling out of you or an upward sensation? No, no, there's, there's nothing there to fall out. <laughs> okay. Do you, wait, okay. So you had a hysterectomy. Yeah. And when did you have that? Oh gosh. 20. Okay. Some years ago. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, um, and did they take your ovaries? Yes. Oh, so you've been in, you've, and have you been using hormone replacement at all in any no. way so you got to have somebody no. so you you desperately need to have somebody look at your skin okay because you may just simply have extreme estrogen atrophy now and using just a little bit of topical estrogen on your vulva and your vagina would would potentially help your urinary tract i don't think you can rule that out okay. right now okay no sounds good and and by the way, you're just glowing. You just your skin looks beautiful right now. Do you have a secret to share with all of us? I think it is just about trying to remain positive. Yes. Sometimes that's all we can do. All right. Well, especially the last, you know, 2020, it's just one of those years in many terrible yeah. ways. All right, Ruth, I'm going to put you, I'm going to silence you. And Okay. And, and you guys, I don't, I'm not, if I accidentally delete you, I apologize. I don't think I will, but just in case I accidentally deleted somebody last week and she got upset with me and I was sorry. Uh, Ale, hold on a sec. I want to try to see if I can unmute Ale. Hmm. I can. Ale, Ale Gutierrez. Okay, I cannot unmute you, which means that you probably have yourself muted on your side. So I'm going to move on. And I will try to come back to you if I can. Anne. Hello, Anne. Are you there? Hello. Hi. I am. I'm right here. How are you so, doing today? Well, I'm doing pretty well. Um, I'm very interested to learn more um, here today and with this group. Um, I... Uh, 
I had symptoms starting in like last year. I've never seen a doctor. Um, I did talk to them, had two urine dips because the symptoms are like, I, but mm -hmm. I don't, didn't have a UTI. Okay. So then um, over the phone, my uh, uh, gynecologist uh, prescribed estrogen. Right. Topical, but I didn't, I didn't really use it. Ooh. Uh, maybe I should. I yeah. still have it. Yeah. I just, you know, I just looked at the side effects and I thought, well, I'm already losing my hair. Well, so I didn't... <laughs> what are you talking about? Est estrogen? Do they support, did they do estrogen or Elmeron for you? Oh, it's in a yellow tube. Okay. Because Elmeron, Elmeron is well known to cause hair, hair loss, but that's a bladder coating. It has nothing to do with hormones. Okay, I'll no, 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 no. You don't want to do Elmeron because no, I'm going to crisscross through it. That's yeah. Because be, I mean, you want to be very careful with it because it's now known to cause eye, eye disease. Okay. So you got to be really, really careful with that. But let's look at this for a moment here. Okay. So this is a three dimensional picture of the bladder wall. And so the bladder wall has, and, and think about it. The bladder is the only organ in the human body designed to hold toxic waste because urine is body waste. Urine contains ammonia and urea and all sorts of other stuff. So how can the bladder hold ammonia for hours at a time and not get damaged? I mean, it's a really, it's a, it's an interesting, you know, piece of, of biology here is how can skin hold irritating substances? And the answer is it's got three layers. It's got a thick outer coating of mucus. It's got, a, and then underneath that, it has the largest single cells in the human body, which are, which is the urothelium. And then underneath that, we've got blood vessels and nerves and mast cells and things like that. But it's the mucus that a lot of people don't understand. Your bladder is like your mouth. It is a hollow organ covered with a thick coating of mucus. We call it the mighty mucus, and it is this thick barrier that protects the, skin, the cells underneath it from irritants and also from infection. But here's the problem. It, this mucosal barrier is estrogen dependent. So when you're young and you have lots of estrogen, you have a really thick, robust coating of mucus. When you're older, you have much less estrogen, and guess what? You have much less mucus. And so what happens then is the irritants and urine are able to penetrate through to the more fragile cells underneath that. We call that the genitourinary syndrome of menopause. And I hit this when I was 51. I mean, the, the place that it hit me was in my urethra. Your urethra is kind of like the canary in the coal mine. So it's your urethra. It's going to be the first to react to the loss of estrogen. And for me, it felt like there was a drop of urine stuck in my urethra that would not come out. Man, and I threw everything I knew at it for three months. I mean, you know, my I see self-help skills are pretty good because I've written a lot of the materials that you guys read about it. And yet, no matter what I did, I could not make this flare go away. And I threw myself on my on the mercy of my uro, of my urologist. So here I am, I'm laying in the stirrups, my feet are in the air, he's looking at me down there. And he goes, Jill. And I'm like, what, what, what'd I do? What'd I do? And he goes, didn't you use the estrogen cream I prescribed for you a year ago? And I went, no. <laughs> and he goes, why? And I said, because in my brain, I'm 25 years old and I can't imagine having anything that's age related. And then he explained that the bottom half of the urethra is exquisitely sensitive to the loss of estrogen. It is usually track to re to speak out when estrogen levels drop below normal and so don't do what i did if he gave you estrogen cream he gave it to you for a reason and that's what he said he, he said jill i wouldn't have given it to you if i didn't see atrophy happening i was trying to prevent this from happening to you ladder symptoms before this if you had no issues in your 30s and 40s and this only began for you at your age, the odds are it's probably estrogen atrophy. 
So I would encourage you to Google uh, genitourinary syndrome of menopause or estrogen atrophy. And just understand that if your vulva is dry and your vagina is dry, then so is your urethra and so is your bladder. That's not a disease. We don't treat that like a disease. It's just the loss of estrogen. And the best way to treat it is giving your, giving your skin a little bit of estrogen. And it works. I mean, I, I, you know, so what he had me do is he gave me a new prescription. He said, I want you to rub a pea-sized drop of estrogen into your urethra for two weeks. And within 10 days, it was gone. All my urethral shirts were gone. And I tend to be a little passive aggressive about some of my self-care. I can wait. I sometimes wait too long. If I, um, if I don't do it for 10 days to two weeks, that burning comes right back. And so, um, and also understand too, that your estrogen cream, when you use it, is going to feel warm. It's, it might even feel hot. It's not burning you. That is a direct reflection of the quality and health of your skin. And so what's going to happen is every subsequent time you use it, the heat will get better and better and better. Until, again, it took 10 days before it was like a little warm puff of air. So be aware of that. And then if you don't use it and it feels hot again, again, that's just a direct reflection of your skin. Okay? Sound reasonable? Hey, man, we are in this together, aren't we? Great, thank you. You are there. Oh, I listen, I have this conversation every single day. And the good news is that, is that, we understand what it is. There's no great mystery. You have billions of icy, icy sisters who go through the same thing. And um, if there are any other issues, like if you're struggling with dryness, we have um, a wonderful product called, um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, oh wait. Here it is. I mean, we can, we can talk about other stuff later too, but V magic is something that will mimic. It's the closest I've ever seen to mimicking natural mucus that you can use because just like a dry mouth hurts and dry mucus membranes down below hurt too. And so organic coconut oil is, is fantastic, but V magic, which is an organic, um, um, uh, uh, olive oil, uh, sea buckthorn oil, avocado, uh, with a little bit of honey and propolis. A lot of patients absolutely love this. There's no harsh chemicals in it that would be irritating to the skin down there. So there's V magic, and then there's also B magic that you can use on your skin too. So you are not alone, my friend. <laughs> we could probably raise hands and Three quarters of the women here, we're all in the same boat. So, all right, hon, any last questions? Yeah, I do. If, uh, because sometimes there's like pressure if I have like a, a bowel movement waiting to come out. That's why it has the most pain these days. Right. I just wonder, is there any, uh, any, uh, is that make sense? Is that common? Well, I mean, so number one, I would want to know a, a couple of things come to mind. Muscles come to mind. And so um, if your muscles are tight, then it's going to be harder to have a bowel movement. It's going to be harder to be more comfortable. Um, and so your muscles. The second thing is sometimes we get little uh, uh, prolapses. I have a little tiny prolapse right there. And so um, uh, sometimes that can, apply, can be a play when bowel movements are painful. But also there's, you know, when muscles are screwed up and when, if there's been a, even a superficial injury, nerves in the area tend to also become irritated. And so uh, it's not unusual for an IC patient to have vulvodynia, which we call IC on the outside. And it's not unusual for a patient to have a tender rectum, a sensitive rectum. I do. I mean, guys, I'll talk about anything. I, I have no shame talking about any of this. And so there are moments when you might struggle with a little bit of rectal sensitivity, again, uh, because the nerves are sensitive or just, again, because of a little bit of estrogen atrophy. But I do have one more question. Is it because I've never been examined? Yeah. It came up and then COVID. 
and it's been phone appointments and it's never gotten too bad, but is there any thing that I need to like rule out like cancer or anything like that? Well, I, I well, there's a lot of things. <laughs> Whoops. Hold on a sec. Somebody just okay. hold on. I got to mute somebody. <laughs> okay. Anne, are you there? That must've been yeah. somebody bombed him. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things we want to rule out. Absolutely. And, and it's very important that you get to the doctor and you have them study your body and look at your body. Um, if you, for example, have bleeding anywhere, if you have bleeding from your vagina or bleeding, and for me, I had like a pale pink lemonade type of, of uh, blush uh, when I had early uterine cancer. It was very, very weird. So um, and we blew it off for nine months before it started to be blood clots and, and it was uh, really bad. So I think it's really, really important that you, you allow somebody to examine you thoroughly, but it's also very, very important that you become very familiar with your body. I mean, especially if you have external pain and discomfort, you got to look, you got to, is it red? Is it, are there spots? Is there anything at all like that? Your ability to walk into the doctor's office and very cleanly and crisply des describe your pain, where it's located specifically to the left, to the right, low, high, inside of your body, outside of your body, what makes it better, what makes it worse. And most importantly, be able to describe the weird symptoms. The ones that you might not even think are related, like do you have do you have pain in your lower back? Do you have a buzzing sensation when you sit down? Do you feel movement? Do you feel a vibration? Uh, do you feel uh, what we call a PGAD, a, 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 a weird arousal sensation that's painful that just comes and goes, which is a sign that a nerve is being compressed? So, um, and they're going to do, a, they should do an appropriate workup where they will send your urine off for a urine cytology test just to make sure that you don't have bladder cancer. IC is not related to cancer at all. You shouldn't worry about that. The number one risk of bladder cancer is smoking. So if you are a smoker, then you definitely want to have a urine cytology test. You know, due diligence over on our website, we have a whole section on confusable conditions and you're just going to work your way through that. Okay. Okay. And then also, the, yeah, the other thing I want you to do is I also want you to think about, because you know what, your patient intuition is powerful. It's powerful. If you associate an event with your symptoms, like falling, taking a long car ride, traveling, whatever, if, if you intuitively go, it started after this, that's an important piece of this puzzle. And so go back to when your symptoms began and think about any, was there anything else weird going on? Like, did you take, you know, did you take a trip somewhere or were you in a car for a long period of time or anything at all like that? Or was somebody sick in your house or whatever? Okay. I was eating a lot of the foods that were, uh, are on the list of irritants. And well, so almost all my whole diet was almost the whole list corresponded to what I was eating okay so I did eliminate so the good thing here so so really you did not understand that your bladder wall was being compromised by the loss of estrogen and so you may have just hit that tipping point where finally your bladder said I can't take it anymore stop pouring acid on me I don't have a nice coating of mucus anymore so it's still all point, it's still, I mean, I, it still is really strongly pointing to just the genital urinary syndrome of menopause, but do your due diligence, get other stuff checked out. And there is, there is hope, my friend, there is hope. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you everybody for your, for allowing me to get this information. You are very, very welcome. All right. I'm going to mute you. Let's see if Ale is here. She unmuted herself once. Ale, Hi, I'm so <laughs> how are you? I'm good. How yeah. how are you? Well, I was diagnosed like um, maybe ten years ago. I have uh, IC, I have IBS, and I have fibromyalgia. Okay, and how old were you? How old are you now? Fifty-four. Okay, so it started when you were in your forties. Okay. 
Exactly. And and of course, they didn't know what it was. And they said, well, if you have one, most likely you have the three of them. Okay. So, yes. Um, but I'm still, of course, I was, at that time, uh, there was nothing but Elmiron, and that was it. Right. So, um, I've been dealing with it, and I, of course, I have allergies as well. Right. So, now that you were talking about this medicine for allergies, I do take that one, and it gets a little better. But, of course, now that I'm starting to get um, menopause symptoms, it's getting even worse. And besides mm -hmm. that, I had a hysterectomy down. So is there something uh, that you guys may know that uh, eases a little bit the pain? Because so, I don't walk, like go for a morning walk, and I don't walk that much, but every time if I try to jog a little bit, my bladder will be in pain at all times. So um, let me just take a step back for a moment and remind everybody that I'm not a doctor and I don't give medical advice. My goal is to educate and empower you give you the information that you need so that you can walk back into your doctor's office, take charge, ask the right questions and have a really just exactly. a really, really good discussion about your treatment options. Okay. So let's just make mm -hmm. it clear here, guys, that this is not medical advice. This is information. What you do with it is your choice. Okay. That said, hon, when we think about moving your symptoms, we always think about muscles we okay. always think about muscles because normal i mean so uh let's see how do i how do i want to explain this um when we think about the five subtypes of ic so we've got five core variants. so we've got hunter's lesions bladder wall injury pelvic floor injury a pudendal nerve injury and central sensitization. Those are the core five subtypes according to the system that I use. It's called the pain subtyping system. So you're describing, you, you, okay. The other thing to be aware of is that patients get stuck in what I call the chicken versus the egg dilemma. Which comes first, the chicken and the egg? And for us, it's which comes first, the bladder or the pelvic floor. They're both going to be involved to some degree because they are so strongly interconnected. They're both involved. We've got so if your bladder is screaming in pain, your muscles are going to get tight to protect you. So if your symptoms began after chemotherapy, we know that your fundamental problem is a badly irritated bladder wall from the chemicals of chemo and your muscles are going to get tight to protect your bladder. That's called the guarding reflex. You cannot turn that off. Our therapeutic priority for that patient is to calm the bladder. When we calm the bladder, the muscles should release. Okay. The opposite also happens probably more frequently. A, a lot of patients I see begins after a muscle injury like having a baby or a car accident or a fall or a hysterectomy or a pelvic surgery. So here you've got a perfectly healthy bladder, but you've got muscles that have been injured, bam. And what happens with an injured muscle is they get tight. And as they get tight, they start restricting blood flow to the bladder. Now you might have no clue you have a muscle injury. The very first symptom is frequency urgency. You call the doctor, you go, hey, I think I have a bladder infection. The doctor throws antibiotics at you. They don't work. You go back to the doctor. The doctor goes, maybe you've got overactive bladder. They give you overactive bladder mitts. They don't work. You go back to the doctor. The doctor goes, maybe you've got IC. They give you IC meds and they don't work. And for this patient, no bladder therapy is going to fix the fundamental problem because the fundamental problem is tight muscles that are restricting blood flow. Our therapeutic priority for this group of patients is to release the muscles and to restore blood flow. When we release the muscles with pelvic floor physical therapy, the bladder gets the blood flow that it needs to be healthy, okay? So understand they're incredibly interconnected. And you gave me tips that both were involved. Number one, you've got, you've got hormone symptoms happening. You've got estrogen yes. atrophy happening. But you also have pain when you move. And 
in, in as an example with IC subtype four pudendal neuralgia, their symptoms are very positional. They're fine when they stand, but when they sit down, it hurts. When they bend over, it hurts. When they squat down, it hurts. Or for me, I have a partial, a little compression of my pudendal nerve on my left side. So if I sit too, lo too long, I get a buzzing sensation and it starts flickering. So I associate movement-driven pain more with muscles that are being tweaked mm -hmm. in some way way to know we've got you've got to number one have your skin checked if your vulva is dry and your vagina is dry then so is your urethra and so is your bladder estrogen atrophy is real it happens to everyone but the second thing we need to know in my opinion is is anything going on with your muscles um mm -hmm. and did you say you had a hysterectomy i did and i have a pinch nerve like nearby the sciatic nerve or sometimes like you said if i'm sitting long time traveling or driving it tell you know it the pain starts so yes i, I was Ex listening to what you were saying exactly what exactly you were talking about. Ex exactly mm -hmm. exactly yes. so understand the toll that long-term muscle tension takes on the bladder wall so you really are you are the perfect example of the chicken versus the egg dilemma our job now is to figure out which is primary and which is secondary. Exactly. And that yes. changes over time. And so if you've got sciatica, you've got tight piriformis muscles like I do, you need to be in pelvic floor physical therapy to work on those muscles, right? Okay. And it's, in, it's not just external work. I mean, let me just share one thing with you. Um, I had for over 10 years, my left side butt pain was getting worse and worse and worse. And if you could see the office chairs I have in my garage right now, I was buying a new office chair every six months or every year so that I could work. And then we have our chair cushions. We have a lot of chair cushions that I would sit on to try to ease this pain. And um, uh, the doctors all said it's a tight muscle. It's a, it, or, it, you know, they were all saying it was tight muscle driven, but it didn't work. And believe me, I was doing every stretch I could possibly done. I am the queen of stretching. I can touch my nose to the ground stretching because I have done so much work trying to fix the sciatic on my left side, which is way better now, by the way. But the pain was just getting worse and worse and the vibration was just getting worse and worse, no matter how much I was stretching. And when I went to, I finally, a year ago, went to a sports therapist. And he figured it out in an instant. He had me walk down the hallway and he goes, Jill, do you realize when you walk, you do this, you walk in curves and you're favoring your left, you're favoring your right side. I was favoring my right side. And I'm like, no, I have no clue why I'm doing that. And what he was able to figure out is that I had overstretched my muscles so badly on my left side that my right side was doing all the work and my glute muscles on my left side were not even activating. And so, and then I showed him what I was doing and he goes, oh my God, stop, stop. Don't you know the damage you're doing doing that? I'm like, no, this is what they all told me to do. They all told me to stretch. They went, no, 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 no. You have now stretched way too far and you've now weakened everything. And, and so, work with a physical therapist and be prepared to do internal work. It was the internal work ultimately in the end that helped me the most. It was not the stretching from the outside. Okay. It's complex, but you can do it. And muscles respond beautifully to therapy. Okay. Okay. I really appreciate that. Uh, okay. You are, everybody. thank you for the time. You're very welcome. Okay. I'm going to mute Ale. And I'm going to go to, uh, let's see if it will work. Uh, sometimes I can unmute people in some kind. I'm trying to unmute B. But it, they won't let me unmute it. So I'm going to move on and I might come back to Beeler. Cecilia, let's see if I can unmute Cecilia. Whoops. I heard something. Oh no, okay, got Beeler's iPad. Yay! <laughs> oh wait, now she's muted again. Oh. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, Beeler's iPad, unmute yourself. <laughs> I'm going to... I'm sorry, my machine is making a noise, so I it No, you're good. You're good, hon. How are you doing today? I'm doing... About Candida. Okay. Because I had an infection because I had to take antibiotic. And I noticed that the Valvidinia improved. And I thought, I wonder if there's a link. Okay. So, so say that to me again. What you're saying is you took an antibiotic and it made your Valvidinia improve? No, I took an antibiotic. implants so i have to um i have to take an antibiotic every time i go to the dentist okay so when i take antibiotics i get candida really bad okay the yeast infection yeah so i took some um diflucacan yeah and the vulvodynia improved and so yeah. i'm wondering if there's a link sure somehow sure you know, um, uh, candida can live anywhere. I mean, a any of us at any given time have fungus on our skin. And there is, there is at any time fungus growing on, on your vulva on the outside as well as inside. Um, and of course, the reason why fungal infections prosper on antibiotics is you're killing the good bacteria that normally keep the bad bacteria in check, correct? Um, so, um, it, it would not surprise me at all if you have, especially since you have had to use antibiotics for any great period of time, that you could have kind of a longstanding candida issue on your vulva. Because again, with my labrata infection, that's where mine was. I never had a discharge. I, I had terrible pain. I mean, the pain of that candida labrata in my bladder was astonishing. It was it was major Vicodin just to get through the day, you know, while we were dealing with it. Um, and they gave me Diflucan, an extended flight Diflucan, and they also use on my vulva, but I didn't think, I thought the, the Diflucan will kill everything. Surely, why would I need a cream? And yet it kept coming back over and over and over again. And that's because I had Candida on my vulva that was seeding the candida in my vagina. And I didn't know that until I ended up at the urgent care one day, just dying, the pain was so bad. And he put me up in the stirrups, took a look down there and he goes, oh my God, I can see the candida burrowed into your vulva. Aren't you using the Nystatin cream? And my answer was no, I didn't think I needed it. And they went, no, you needed it. There's not enough blood supply on the vulva for a significant amount of Diflucan to get at least that's what they told me to get to the candida infections on, on, on the, on the, on the extreme edges of your vulva. And that's why they give you the cream. And so, you know, if you have any doubt, you could have a next generation urine test. You could have a next generation can a swab of your, of your vagina. I did that and see what they find. Um, it would be, okay. it would be fascinating. If you go to bladderhealth.org, that's our, that's my link to, here it is, bladderhealth.org. Um, you can order a urine swab, you can order a typical urine test, you can order an STI test, you can order a vaginal swab. And that's what I did with, uh, I had a vulvodynia outbreak last year just because I thought it was yeast and it ended up being um, tight pelvic floor muscles. I never really associated, I was getting pins and needles on my vulva. And I, again, everybody thought it was yeast. This was a year ago, year and a half ago. And I did all of the yeast meds, nothing worked. And then they said it was eczema steroids didn't work and then finally they went jill it's your it's your pelvic floor your pelvic floor is so tight it's squeezing the nerves of your vulva so it could be either or hun i i do pt and everything and yeah. internal stuff so i know it's not that but i've had the vulvodynia and they've never said anything about yeast and it just made me wonder this time when it came up because this is the second time i've had 
the yeast infection again mm -hmm. in a very short period. And I thought, what's going on? Mm -hmm. But the strange thing was, is it improved the vulvodynia, which has never happened before. And I thought, oh, well, that's, that yeah, that's meaningful. And that's something you've got to if, share that with your doctor, because that's a clue. That's a, that's a clue. Also be really getting on things that are hot. One of the, yes. one of the reasons why I got, we, I realizing in hindsight, why my candida labrata was so bad on my vulva is that one of my dear friends gave me a seated, a heated chair cushion. Oh, and I loved it. I had it here in the office. I just sat on it all the time, not understanding that heat is creates the perfect environment for a candida to grow. So yeah. that was the other reason why I got this really, really super resistant drug infection, you know, yeast infection was from sitting on a hot chair cushion. So yeah. anyway, I, you won't know until you know, have the test. It'll tell you one way or all. Okay. Okay. And you don't need a, a doctor's strip for that? Right? You do. I mean, you order the test, okay. you order the test, they send it to you and then you make, you take it to the doctor for a vaginal swab or a vulvar swab they can do the swab for you and then they sign off on it. And I will tell you that- Can you that, tell me the name of the, the test again? Well, it's just a next generation DNA test. And yes, you can have yes. it done of your, your, on your vaginal swab or a vulvar swab. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So, you know, the proof is in the pudding. I, you know, guessing only gets you so far. At some point in time, you want some facts. Um, and, uh, there you go. And you know what guys, we're having a lot of fires right now and they just announced a new fire just came across my email. Fire season is beginning in California, my friends. It's not fun. Okay. Good luck. Let us know what they say and understand too, that quite a few doctors are, um, uh, they, because next generation testing isn't covered by, uh, by insurance or they might not be on their formulary, they might poo poo it. And I think your, your answer is, listen, I, I'm just looking for data here. Your testing is not finding anything. I would like to do the tests that the researchers do just once. I will pay for it. What the hell? We have nothing to lose. Let's see if it finds anything. You know, and most doctors would be fine with that. If you have a doctor who's not fine with that, Microgen, the company that does it, can connect you with a doctor who will who will um, help you. Okay. All Thank right. You. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So, did we? Let's see. You guys, bear with me here. Um. We did, we did Cecilia, right? Did we do Cecilia? Okay. Cecilia, I can't see your screen. Dar uh, Darian. Let me see if I can unmute Darian. Darian, yes, I can. Hello. Hello, Hello. Darian. How are you today? Gosh, you didn't pronounce my name right. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm I'm pretty new to this, and but I already got a lot of information, like about the the you know the uh, ointment on your uh, in your vagina and on your um, urethra. That that was great, and uh, um, I I guess I just need to do that, and I just really appreciate uh, what you're doing. Are you going to have another one of these? Oh yeah, we're doing them. We're doing them almost every Sunday now. And um, for IC Awareness Month, if Donna's in here, uh, we're going to do, I'm going to start bringing in big guest speakers and we'll try to do big events, you know. Uh, so if I can bring in uh, Rob Muldwin or Robert Evans or Ken Peters, Julie Beyer, the dietitian, phys physical therapist to really give you an opportunity to meet the best of the best and learn from the best, uh, that's what we're going to do. And now we have the technology to do it with, with Zoom. So it's a, it's just quite an experiment for all of us, but it's very, very Thanks. helpful. So, all right, hun. Well, do you have any other questions that I can help oh, you yes. with? Or are you good? Very helpful. Uh, uh, thanks. I'll try uh, you again next time if I can think of one. Thank okay. You. you are very welcome. Okay. All right. Here, hold on a sec. So I've got, all right. Deanna. Let me try to unmute Deanna.
Deanna, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? I can. How are you today? I'm doing um, all right. I think I probably got my answer already because you reminded me about my, that I need to get back in for my pelvic floor um, work. Time every six, eight months, I have to get back in and remind myself to do that stretching. Yeah. My concern was, um, well, I've had IC for a long time, and like um, Udi, I have fibromyalgia. Okay. And I have the IBS and everything, so everything's down there. It's tight. Yeah. Constipation. Yeah. And uh, what I'm finding at night is when I get up to urinate. Um, I'm having a hard time urinating. I have to like put the water on and really focus in order to start the stream. And I'm thinking that's probably my pelvic floor muscles yep. being very tight. Yep. I went through, it was interesting. I flared um, uh, about 10 days ago with a pelvic floor flare. And I don't really know what triggered it, but all I could, I could feel things getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And then like you, I wasn't starting my urine stream right away. And then, you know, there are just, there's a, oh God. I mean, it's so weird that you, we feel the, you know, we're not meant to feel these symptoms, but there's like a, like a stiffness by the perineum. You know, there's just like a, it's not locking down, but it's very stiff. And that's when you get out your internal wand and you got to, I mean, I just started doing my, my internal pelvic floor work and it's gone and it's way better again, but it just reminds me that I have to be on top of that. And yeah, it's weird with me because it's only at night that I, I tend to have this problem, but you know, everything is always at night with IC. Yeah, but that's. But that's normal because you don't have the distractions of the daytime. During the daytime, we're so easily distracted. It's the subtleties that bring it out at night. I absolutely am exactly the same way. It's really rare that I feel anything during the day, except I could feel that stiffening. I mean, you know, if you can't pee easily, you know, your muscles are tight, you know, yeah, yeah. but I it's to go back to the basics. You do. Yeah, you do. And, and you know what, in the newsletter I sent out, um, uh, I, there's an article in there from uh, Pelvic Pain Rehab that talks specifically about how to protect your, floor, your pelvic floor during times of stress. And it's written by one of the best physical therapists, uh, the best physical therapy teams in the world. And who wouldn't in the last three months be de dealing with much more tight muscles? You know, is that in this newsletter? In the newsletter that went out last night at midnight. Okay, um, I can, let me, yeah, let me see if I can, hold on a sec. I can share it, it here. Let me just share my screen here real quick. Jill, I don't know if you remember, but I'm the gal who called you about three years ago. I had the cardiac arrest after getting the Botox in my bladder. Do you remember I, I called you? Yes. Oh my and God. And I am healing. I can almost read now. And yeah, that was me. <gasps> so you guys, so this was such an important story because, yeah. you know, they, when, whenever you have Botox, you would like to think that you by your clinicians about what the potential side effects are. And you had the worst possible side effect. Botox got into your bloodstream, got to your heart and caused your heart to stop. And, and if I remember correctly, they did not tell you why it happened. They did not tell me, the hospital did not tell me anything. And were you ever, were you able to confirm that? Were you, were, were did they never, ever take responsibility for that? They would never take responsibility. <gasps> and I saw four attorneys that all said the same thing that I had to have a, um, Here's my brain, my brain not working because of my, yeah, um, yeah. I had to have a professional doctor say exactly what happened in order to go to court against the hospital. I had to have that 
person in line and I didn't have that person because they would never say what happened. Did you ever, um, and it had to be somebody in the OR at the hospital who, who would say that? Yeah. Oh my God. But I did like you come to file with the FDA and everything. And I did that. So, you know, I'm another case because you were so good. You looked it up and you said, oh yeah, look, there's this percentage of people who were Botox in, in the public floor oh. have this happen to them. So anyway, I'm doing great. I it's am. Great so, oh my you. God. You just totally made my month. It is because we oh. hadn't talked in like three years since it happened. Yes. And I had wondered how you were doing. This no, is and I just uh, came inside from work from working in the yard and I turned this on. I'm like, oh, there's Jill. I gotta listen to Jill. Oh my <laughs> God. Well, oh, it's I'm oh, you just totally made my day. And I believe that we told your story in my newsletter at some oh, point. I, I don't remember. I think I don't maybe we were waiting for info, but if you would like to write it up, write up what happened to you. We need sure. to we need to educate patients about this because your heart stopped in the recovery. Didn't your heart stop in the recovery room? No, it was actually eight hours after. Oh, oh okay, the okay. Procedure. Okay, that's just crazy. Yes. And it was six to ten minutes. I was, yeah, down. Oh my so god! Oh my I'm god! A, I'm a miracle. I will write it up for you because I think it's very important for. Um, people with IC to know that go in for Botox. You just have to be so careful. Absolutely. This is a, you know, awareness is everything. Awareness is everything. Um, I was going to see Can if. I have a quick question. Yeah. About that. Why, why did you have, who recommended Botox? For what reason? What was it indicated for? Well, I've kind of gone down the treatment line and I was at the step where I was looking at Botox helping me with the pain. And so my PT had mentioned the Botox and here in Phoenix, Arizona, we have a specialist that's known for doing Botox and he does it for 30 minutes in the bladder, which is longer than typical. Um, his name is Michael Hibner. So I went to see him and to try it out. And I was the first patient this ever happened to. Oh, so sad. It was terrible. So sad. All right. Well, you good. You write it up and you send it back to send it to me and let's educate people. Okay. They, okay. they, they need Sounds to know. Good. I'm so glad you dropped in. This is so cool. Yeah. Great to see you and uh, all the ladies. We are in this together. All right. Hey, you know what? I'm going to jump around here. I see Stacy. Stacy, we're in my favorite color purple. Hi. It's so Hi. nice to meet you. It's so nice to meet you, too. How are you today? I'm doing all right today. Um, I, want, I'm, I think I'm somewhat of a complex case, not so much because of severity, but because of the factors that contribute to me having IC. Okay. So chronic pelvic pain since I was 12 years old. And it took until I was 30 and almost hemorrhaged three, I actually hemorrhaged three times, almost died, before they realized I had adenomyosis and endometriosis both. And by the time they went in, I was in surgery for well over six hours. It was spread to my bowel, to my cervix. My bowels were right here to my cervix. It was all over my ovaries. And that just started just a long life of surgeries. I'm 41 now. And so learning about the estrogen atrophy, I think that makes sense from yeah. based on my symptoms. I already know about the pelvic floor. I've had uh, trauma with the motor vehicle accidents, like yeah. severe trauma muscles I have nerve damage right um earlier I also have the skin sensitivities the eczema the um hydrogenitis supertiva like I have like so many factors that from what I'm learning can all be contributing to me having I see well I think I I think we what whenever we're talking with somebody who has childhood I see 
our childhood symptoms. I mean, there are a couple of things that are always worthwhile, but you know what, before we go there, um, I think I want to shut down our Facebook. I don't see, okay, you guys, Hey, listen for everybody on Facebook. I'm going to post the, the invitation one more time. I'm going to shut down the Facebook feed real quick. So there's your, Oh, Oh, quick. Oh, oh God. Wait. Oh my God. I must just shut it down before putting the link here. Hold on a sec. Let me just shut this down real quick. Cause what, I, I don't want to get into personal stuff and have it, have a broadcast and Thanks. yeah. So Facebook, you are over. Come join us. Um, all right. YouTube, same thing with YouTube. We have been going for two and a half hours. All right, so YouTube, you have the invite. I'm gonna shut down YouTube now too, okay? See ya, YouTube. See ya next week. All right, now 